So we're starting in 1.3. Uh, we did 1.2 in class, 1.1 we talked a little bit about, but feel free to read through it on your own. 1.3 starts with four definitions. Uh, these are definitions that will definitely be on the next exam, probably on the final exam as well. Two of these definitions we saw before in the political scientist example in class. Our population is the group of people that we want to actually know about. This is, this is the group that we want to study. Usually, it is not possible for us to take a census and get information from all of those people, so we take a sample. Sample is a subset of that population. They're the people we actually collect information from. And our inferential statistics, remember, are when we're using that sample to draw those conclusions about the population. The next two definitions are new um, to us for this course. Parameter and statistic, both of these definitions are measurements from a particular group of people. The parameter is from the population, and a statistic is a measurement from the sample. So easy enough for the test, P goes with P, S goes with S, to remember which is which. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time, uh, not really, but in class I would have. I want you to read through the next question, try to identify what was that population, the group we wanted to know about, who was the sample, the group they actually collected data from, what was the measurement from the population, and what was the measurement from the sample. So take a moment, pause the video, read through this, and decide. Okay, so you should have read through this. Your population would have been California voters because this was a California ballot measure. Um, our sample, well, CNN surveyed 888 California voters. So we got our population. We want to know about everyone. We're going to use these 888 voters to draw some conclusions. Reading through, we got parameter and statistic, our measurements. We have two different percents that are given to us in the question that 53% and the 54%. The 53% is in the same sentence as our sample. So that is from our sample, that's our statistic. So 53% of the 888 uh, were opposed to voting, opposed to, to Prop 19. 54% uh, is our parameter. That was the actual amount at the end. Uh, some people would argue this is not really a parameter because it's the people who showed up to the poll, um, but we're kind of getting into semantics there. That's really who CNN was interested in. So one thing I like to mention about this particular question is it previews where we're going later in the course. Um, if you're reading through this, we had this 53% opposed to Prop 19 with a margin of error of 3.5%. A margin of error means, and we'll again get this later in the course when we're in the proportions section, that we believe that 53% of people are going to be opposed, but we have this plus or minus, this amount that we're unsure about, of 3.5%. Now, if you actually add and subtract 3.5% from 53%, what you're going to get is that we think 49.5% to 56.5% of California registered voters are going to be opposed to Prop 19. That's what the CNN poll tells us. And unfortunately, that means the CNN poll is pretty much useless because if we're here, Prop 19 passes. And marijuana would have been legal back in 2010 instead of in this last election cycle, right? And if it's over here, right, doesn't pass. So that's why this particular poll is, is fairly useless is because CNN says, eh, we don't know, it could pass, it could not pass. It doesn't matter that more of the uh, interval here is in the doesn't pass section. Um, and that's what we're going to learn a lot more about when we get to this confidence interval section. So we're going to really understand how they calculate this, what conclusions we can draw from it, and also if CNN wanted to actually be able to have a conclusive decision here, um, how many people we would have really needed to survey. We'll have that formula as well. So we'll talk all about that when we get to part six of the lecture notes. All right, so the next exercise, I want you guys to just take a moment. Um, for each of these things, just read through and decide um, if you're given a statistic or a parameter. So I'm going to do the first one 
and then I'll give you a chance to pause and, and try it on your own. So first question, uh, statement here says the actual average height of all adult human males in the U.S. is 5 foot 9.4 inches. Now, this is a parameter. It is a completely ridiculous parameter because there is no way we could get the height of every single adult male in the U.S. Uh, we can't even take an accurate census as we discussed in class. So this is, this is bananas, right? But there are two words that made me choose parameter here. The word actual and the word all. Actual is telling me this is the true thing. This is not an estimate from a sample. Um, and all is telling me it's from everybody. It's from the entire population. So while this is infeasible, based on the way it's written, we're going to call this a, a parameter because it's from the population. So I'm going to give you a moment here. I want you to pause. Just quickly write down S or P's for everything and come back. All right, you better have paused because you don't get as much out of just listening to me tell you the answers. Uh, next, B is a sample or a statistic. We have the word sample there, which tells us this value of 60%. This measurement is from a sample. Uh, C, we have a number of houses, a count. Uh, this measurement, there's nothing in here to tell me it's from a sample that it's being estimated. Um, so we're going to go with a parameter. And it does make sense in this case, if we're talking about homes in Santee, you know, they collect property tax on every house, so they definitely have this information. This is a completely reasonable parameter to exist. Uh, D, we have another statistic. Again, we have that keyword of sample, uh, letting us know that that average age of 43 is from a sample, so it is a statistic. Um, e is a tough one. This is one where I always preface it when I do this one in class, um, that it really depends. We were told that the average SAT score in California in 1990 was 897. Now, without knowing the population of interest, this particular question, I could see you calling it a statistic because you're sitting there going, well, maybe they're using California to estimate the entire U.S. Or maybe they're using 1990 to estimate another year. Uh, without any more information, we're going to assume that this group, California in 1990, was the population of interest. So I'm going to call this a parameter. Nothing here saying that we're using that particular year as uh, an example for other years or to estimate other years. Um, F, we have another statistic here that 36% is coming from a survey. A survey is another way to say sample. We're not talking to every single person when we do a survey. Uh, G was another tough one. Um, challenging. It is a statistic. And the word that makes it a statistic is estimates. Uh, this tells us that this median income that they have there is, is not the real one, right? We had actual in A, and now we have estimates here saying it's not the real deal. We're probably using a sample to, to come up with that number. So it'll be a statistic. Uh, and then H is almost identical to our uh, previous one, E. We're talking about a certain year in California. We have a percentage of deaths that were ruled a suicide in prisons. Um, nothing here to indicate that that is from a sample or it's a number that they couldn't have gotten. So this will be a parameter. But again, it could have been a statistic if they were trying to talk about all prisons in the U.S. or other years. So um, if you had statistic, I totally know where you're coming from. But that's why we're going with parameter in these cases. All right, so our keywords to signal if we're dealing with a statistic instead of a parameter, obviously sample, survey, and estimates. This is not all of them. We could also have things like poll would be another good one. Poll is like a survey or a sample. Um, this is going to become really important, especially when we get to part even six, but mostly seven of the lecture notes. Um, whether we're given a sample standard deviation or a population standard deviation, a statistic or a parameter, is going to change what type of test, what type of interval we do. So this careful reading to be like, what's in the sentence to tell me if this is from a sample or a population um, is going to be crucial throughout the course, which is why we start with it now. We're going to keep revisiting it. Okay, so we've already done these two. We'll skip them. 
And we move on to our next guaranteed test question, Te our good sampling methods. So these big four that are listed here, these are the ones that will be on the exam. Um, I usually do this question as a multiple choice and you just have to identify which is used. Um, I've also done it as more of a free response, similar to the question about sampling students from statistic cla uh, statistics classes that's in your homework. So the big four are a simple random survey, so an, a simple random sample. In a simple random sample, which I will lazily call an SRS, um, everyone is equally likely to be selected into the sample. Uh, this is analogous to pulling names out of a hat, right? So if I wanted to know something about um, our class, I'd put everybody's names in a hat and I would just randomly grab names out of that hat or use a random number generator or something to get that. One issue with a simple random sample is that random truly does mean random. So it is possible that you get out a sample that is entirely female or, or predominantly female. Um, and if you're asking a question that happens to maybe have some gender bias involved in it, that could be an issue. So if you want to make sure that your sample is representative of the population for some characteristic, what you can do is a stratified random sample. So in a stratified sample, you're going to go ahead and instead of saying, put everybody put their names in the hat, you go, okay, I'm worried that I don't want to have a disproportionate amount of females or males in my sample. I want it to be similar to the class. So I have two hats, one for the males, one for the females. And then I pull, say, 10 female names and 10 male names. And now I have a sample that's got an equal number of males and females. So I'm imposing that sort of same proportions that are in the population, that same variability in the population on my sample. Um, so uh, two things to note about the stratified random sample that you could write down here to kind of keep these straight. I'm um, looking for space is the problem, is you want uh, the groups are similar to one another on some way. Simil I give up. Similar <laughs> to each other in some way. Um, and then we are going to take a sample from each group. And let's just say we're going to sample people from each group. I'm making a big deal of this because students always get this confused with cluster sampling, our next type of sampling. So in a cluster sample, usually you come along and the group, the population is already divided into groups. So in our class, uh, you could maybe look at the rows of chairs. Um, yes, all of my classes have rows. So in the rows of chairs, you've got students who sit in the front of the class, students who sit in the back of the class, so it's a nice you know, mix of the students who, in terms of their seating preferences. You've got men and women in every row. So it's a, it's a very little good little sample, right? It's nice and mixed up. So what I would do instead of putting all the names into a hat, hell of a lot easier, I could just number one through six, because the six different rows in the classroom, and pull one of those out of the hat, or pull two of those out of the hat, depending on how big my sample needs to be. So that's a cluster sample. Now our groups are going to be dissimilar. Oops. And we're going to sample entire groups. So the mechanics of this are a lot easier because we're pulling out, you know, group numbers instead of having all the names and doing a sampling process twice. Uh, but there can be issues with this, right? There may be students who know each other sitting in the same row. So we're, we're not necessarily guaranteed to have something as nice. And some rows may end up being predominantly male or female if that's what we're worried about. So um, one thing I'll say about this is do make sure uh, you pay more attention to the second half of each of these, um, the mechanics, because there are examples that I have written, and you'll see them uh, in some of the review material, where I have said like, oh, let's use each airplane in a day's worth of flights. Let's use them as a uh, cluster or a strata, and you can use it either way. You can be like, oh, they're dissimilar because you have first class and coach 
all within the same plane, so it's a good cluster, or you can say they're all similar because they have the same exact flight. So don't get too caught up in the first part, pay more attention to the mechanics of how the sampling is being done.